Okay, today we're going to talk about automated test case generation and fuzzing. Before I start, there is a quite good resource that's available for free online, and you could teach a whole course on fuzzing. This is not this course, but you could do it. And so I would encourage you to look at this, this reference, fuzzingbook.org, written by experts in the field. All right, so what we've talked about today is manual test case generation. And it's not that fun. No one wants to do it. It's laborious and difficult. You have to think, and you have to think hard. You have to think hard about things that, ways that your program can fail that you really don't want to think about. So it takes human time and effort, and it requires understanding the tested code. You can do some testing, of course, without understanding your tested code, but the best kinds of tests include also some tests that do really require understanding of the tested code, as in white box testing. All right, so if there's things that we don't want to do, then one approach is to say, well, could a computer do it? And so let's think about automated test case generation, and it's what we're going to talk about in this lecture. So the idea is to make the computer do the work. And we won't talk too much about why this doesn't work all, all well all the time, but we'll, we'll say that a bit. It does work pretty well for finding certain kinds of things, though. All right. The approach that we're going to use here, and there are other approaches which we're not going to talk about in this course, is the approach of fuzzing. And so this is a set of automated testing techniques that <clears throat> tries to identify abnormal program behaviors by evaluating how a test program responds to certain inputs. It's like it doesn't really know which inputs are important, so it's basically going to try randomly to find good inputs, and it's going to try to use feedback to do so. Things are, everything old is new again. And so here's a quote from 2017, and it's about something that this programmer did in the 1950s. And so the quote is, we didn't call it fuzzing back in the 1950s, but it was our standard practice to test programs <coughs> by inputting decks of punch cards taken from the trash. Our random trash decks often turned in turned up undesirable behavior. Every programmer I knew, and there weren't many of us back then, so I knew a good proportion of them, used the trash deck technique. That, of course, works when you have this physical punch card, which I don't have, and you put it into the punch card reader, and you can run your program on it. The situation was, of course, different then, too, because you didn't have to face attacks from the internet for your code. Your code was running in a trusted environment. Um, and there was also this physical artifact that you could do, which was easier than when we moved away from this physical artifact. But let's talk about the problem of fuzzing and in particular how it how we do it now. And so there's a bunch of problems that are hard about fuzzing. So there's finding interesting inputs and the, the approach is to do it randomly. You want to explore as much as possible the whole system, not just individual tools or functions. And the idea here is that if you test randomly, you can very easily get stuck in individual tools or individual functions and not explore anything interesting about the behavior of the system as a whole. You also want to reduce the size of test cases and you want to reduce duplication. Um, so test cases being big is a pain. And what that causes is your, your iteration loop for fuzzing to be slower. And that means that you're less powerful. A duplication is the same thing. So you don't need two tests that, that explore the same thing. Just one test is enough. So in addition to the, the testing book, the fuzzing book, which I've pointed you to, uh, which really is a great reference, there's this Communications with ECM article from February 2020, which is much shorter than the whole book. And I encourage you to read it as well. It's an introduction to fuzz testing. OK. So what's the stupidest thing that could possibly work? And that often works in many contexts. So it's useful to have this as a reference. And so let's, let's talk about dumb fuzzers. So what could you do? You could just feed random input. A bit after the era of punch cards, but before the modern era, there was modems. So instead of having your, you know, cable modem or DSL modem, you'd have an actual modem 
that would plug into the phone line, the you know the actual in wall phone line, and it would convert bits <coughs> into sounds. And so one way of getting black box of getting fuzz tests is by producing line noise by blowing into the phone, and that produces unexpected output to your program as well. So you can just do things and produce basically totally random inputs and then monitor the test for test programs for odd behaviors. So it's kind of like the like Shakespeare and Infinite Monkey Theorem. If you do that, you'll eventually get something useful, but it might take you a very long time. And so there's some benefits to it. It's easy to implement and it's fast. So you can cat random and you can pipe it to your test application. That'll work sometimes. It doesn't work very well for most applications now because they're resilient enough to bad input in that way because they've done, been fuzz tested and so they'll be <coughs> resilient to the tests that you do with fuzz testing in general. So it's not great. It works kind of, but not that well. And the issue is that it relies on the luck of random inputs. So you've got to be lucky to find the, the thing. And if you run it long enough, then you'll get lucky, but maybe you don't have long enough to run to make it work. And so in a particular, it might fail because it runs the same things again and again. And that just doesn't tell you very much about the program. For instance, and we'll get back to this later, if you have a compiler, then if you think about compiler errors, there are several kinds of compiler errors that you can have. So you might have syntax errors, or you might have type errors, but you'll encounter the syntax errors first. And if you, if you generate input randomly, you just get syntax errors. It's going to be vanishingly unlikely to get to the type errors. And so you have this notion of very shallow program exploration. Having said that, there are examples of dumb feathers other than just you, you random. And so ZZUF is one example, and I've included the link here. There are smarter fuzzers that are not quite as dumb as just generating random input. And the ones we'll talk about are two. We will talk about American Fuzzy Lop, and we'll talk about LibFuzzer. So AFL actually works pretty well. It was developed, I guess, up to seven years ago in the main, and I think development continues, but not as intensively. If you read the design documents, which they have quite a few, then it's like, well, we're not going to be super tied to any one particular practice. We just try to get something that's effective as possible and as simple as possible. And so you just try to run the program and it's actually going to run the program and look for interesting behaviors by monitoring it. So it monitors progress and it also minimizes test cases. And it's not just a dumb random thing. It, it tries to be smarter. Um, it works for Rust and Python as well. And there's Lin Linux and Mac implementations and then a fork as Windows. So that's one example, AFL. Another example is libfuzzer which is part of the LLVM compiler runtime. So LLVM you'll probably use when you compile things on computers these days. That also got developed in a similar time period, 2015 to 2016. And libfuzzer was designed as part of the LLVM compiler infrastructure. And so there's benefits to being tied to the compiler infrastructure. You get information about the program. It also supports other LLVM based languages like Rust and Swift. And like AFL, it works for Linux, Mac, and Windows. So we have pretty good coverage of different technologies, not all of them, um, but if you're doing something that's not too weird, then you'll be able to use fuzzing. And these things are not just input, they instrument the program, and so they actually need to know something about how the program was written as well. So there's fuzzers, and then you can have fuzzers running all the time. And so there's this project, OSS Fuzz, that continually see fuzzes open source projects using clusters. And so basically it takes a project, it builds a project, and on the cloud, it's going to just keep on feeding inputs to the project. And um, when it finds something, it's gonna file bugs and verify that the fixes happen. So the verify fixes, it's going to record which was a sketchy input, which was a crashing input, and then it's gonna try it again once that bug that, that got issued, that got done. Um, a bug report but reported was fixed. I guess this is not completely automatic, um, but it's it's pretty automatic. So you can actually look right now if you click the link. Well, you can't click the link on the on the video file, but you can click the link 
on the um, on the PDF of the lecture, and you'll get this page which shows the compilation bots that are currently running that are doing open source projects and fuzzing them. So it's a real thing and it's working and you can check it out. All right, so why is fuzzing hard? Okay, there's a bunch of challenges and we'll go through some of them now. Um, and there's more that I'll just talk about just off the top of my head. The first input, the first problem is one about inputs. And so the example I showed you was, well, let's take a program that works on a command line and takes inputs and just feed it random bits. Well, sure, you can do that. Uh, but it's harder when it's a web application, for instance, which is a pretty common kind of thing. And so you need to generate some sort of web input like button presses and mouse movements, which can be done, but it's not that straightforward. Um, there's solutions for AFL and the fuzz I wish to do this. So AFL provides wrappers and then reads input from files and provides them to the tested program. So AFL relies on the program taking input on standard input on the command line. Libfuzzer outsources this problem to the developer. And so if you want to run a program with Libfuzzer, you have to provide fuzz targets. And this program, this fuzz target has got to be a thing that provides some access to the functionality of the program, hopefully getting past some of the annoying things that you need to get to interesting behavior. And then you call this function again and again, or the fuzzer does that, and observes hopefully interesting behavior on the program. So the fuzzing engine is going to execute the fuzz target multiple times with the inputs, and these targets are going to be generated randomly. The second challenge is, well, this is actually, to my mind, a big challenge with fuzzing. So what does it mean to detect abnormal behavior? And so in, in some sense, you need an oracle. So what does it mean for the program to be wrong? If it prints five instead of printing three, how do you know? Basically for that type of mistake, you don't know. You can find out, well, programs are never supposed to crash. So if the program crashes, then you know, okay, that's definitely a mistake. Or if you're lucky enough that there are assertion failures in the program or assertions in the program, and sometimes the assertions fail, then that's a sign that something wrong happened. Um, or the execution takes too long. What does too long mean? That's hard because again, we have a halting problem and we don't know the maximum time that the execution might take. But if, if five executions each take like 10 seconds and then you have one execution that takes like five minutes, then you know that that execution is probably flaky. Or you can look at the program allocating too much memory. So this tells you something, but it's not really telling you that program does the right thing. All it tells you is that the program is not doing the obviously wrong thing. It's not crashing, right? And so it's not great, I don't love it. And so we talked about what makes good tests and these aren't super awesome tests. They're testing for basic functionality of the program, which the program has to satisfy, but really there is so much more that, that one could imagine checking and one, does, one should check in handwritten tests. Again, it's not fun to do that, no one wants to do that, but it will give you better tests. Okay, so crash detection is one tool that you have, and programs don't necessarily crash right away when there's something wrong. And so the other lecture next week is going to be about sanitizers. And so there's address sanitizer, thread sanitizer, memory sanitizer, undefined behavior sanitizer, and leak sanitizer. So the idea here is that these things are compiling with the program and they monitor the program's execution. If the program execution does something definitely wrong, if it accesses memory that's out of bounds or if it's doing a race condition um, or it's doing something that's undefined behavior that the language specification does not guarantee any behavior for, then, well, what could the program do? What could the CPU do? It could continue running it, which is what it usually does, or it could instantly crash. And if you run the program under a sanitizer, then it's going to instantly crash. And that means that it can be detected by the, um, the fuzzing tool much more effectively than waiting for it to actually come up with a, a failure and detecting that. So remember we talked about faults, errors, and failures. So this is kind of where it makes the error visible right away as a failure. And so if you can shorten the timeline from error to failure, that makes fuzzing more effective. Okay, 
more challenges. There are lots of challenges to making fuzzing work well. And another one is ensuring progress. So you just keep on doing random inputs. And maybe those random inputs aren't doing anything interesting, anything new interesting, right? They're just more random, but the interesting inputs are in a corner of the input space. So we want to explore that corner. So how do we know that fuzzing is exploring more program state over time? We talked about coverage and coverage can be useful here because it can guarantee that you're doing things that you didn't do before. And I said, my, my position on coverage is that for most purposes, all you care about is statement coverage. And most purposes is handwritten tests. This is not quite as true for, um, for fuzzing because it observes error states in the program potentially. And so it can, it has access to more sources of information. So it might be useful to look at coverage at the level of instructions, lines of source code, statements, nodes, edges. And then I didn't really talk about paths. It turns out that AFL actually uses paths uh, of length two in its, um, its notion of coverage. And in that case, it's actually useful. It actually wants to know about when you have E and then F or when you have F and then E. So it actually cares about the order in which you execute statements or it functions. All these are basically pretty correlated. And so for most purposes, it won't matter too much which, which coverage you want. But in this case, it matters a bit. There is a statement that we can make here, which is that tracking coverage process progress has to be fast. Um, because fuzzing, you have to run lots and lots and lots of inputs and see what happens. And so if it takes too long, then you run fewer inputs and your fuzzer doesn't detect anything useful. All right. So yeah, as I said, AFL is actually going to do branch coverage. And so this is what AFL does. So when there's a, when there's a branch, then it inserts these instructions uh, before the branch. So it records some sort of random number that's generated at compile time based on the current location. So that's a tag for this location. Um, it turns out this tag only matters for fuzzing, so it's not something that's necessarily visible to the user. And then it increments a pointer, which is the exclusive OR of the current location and the previous location. And then it calculates the previous location as being the current location shifted to the right by one. And so basically it knows when something interesting is happening, when the program execution is doing edges that it hasn't previously run. And we'll see, I think in the next few slides, what this can actually do. This is actually surprisingly powerful in some cases. There's feedback modes. So for instance, there's wrappers around C and C++ compilers like GGC and Clang or G++ and Clang++. And so this is assembly level rewriting for the instrumentation that I showed you in the previous slide, how it puts things and monitors execution. Or you can be a bit smarter about it and that makes it about two times faster. Being smarter is surprisingly useful sometimes. Um, the instrumentation I think is not too slow. It's reasonably fast, but faster is better. Okay, so we talked about AFL, um, right? So let's talk now about libfuzzer. So at this point, at, at, for this library, there's many possible sources of a compiler level coverage instrumentation and there's mutators. And so libfuzzer can do tracing of branches, basic blocks and functions. Um, we talked about counters in the previous thing. Libfuzzer also supports counters if you want. And it can also trace data flow, like compare instructions, switch statements, divisions, and point arithmetic. Doesn't change that much about how this thing works. But how this thing works is basically like this. So I put the algorithm, which is basically fuzzing and some explanations. So basically you have a seed corpus and you have a queue of things that you still want to see and a set of observations that you've observed that are interesting. And while you're continuing to do the fuzzing, you're going to choose a candidate from the queue, uh, avoiding observations you've done already. And then you're going to mutate this candidate and you're going to run the program on the mutated candidate. If it's an interesting observation, um, for instance, it crashes the program, then you put the mutated thing in the queue so that you can do more mutations on it. And you record this observation that you had about the, um, the program behavior. So it's like, this is an interesting input. Be sure to check it out uh, when you're done with, with, um, with fuzzing. 
All right, so AFL works and JPEG seem kind of structured. And usually you say, well, fuzzing, how can it work with something structured? And so this is a case study um, there. If you look at the, the blog post in the upper right corner, you'll see more description of it, but we'll just give the quick summary of it here. And this is how we can create from a text file that just has, says hello, we're going to do fuzzing and we're going to get JPEGs like the ones we have on the bottom. Each of these is an individual JPEG. So you start by writing a fuzzer and okay. So the initial thing in the queue is hello. And the JPEG is a program that runs on JPEG files. And it's gonna say, nah, that is not a JPEG file. It starts with HE. So then the fuzzer keeps on modifying the, the hello file to get more inputs. And so it turns out that Eventually, so JPEG files have to start with, I think, JPEG or something. And it's like, okay, if we mutate the first byte, then we get different inputs. So it starts saying premature end of JPEG file. And so it's like, aha, I'm going to look there. And I'm going to explore the space around that, that space in the input. And then it keeps on doing it. And eventually, it can navigate to a space in the input where it starts producing JPEG files. And so you look at like Q num element number 1282, and that is a 7K input file, which is a JPEG. So it works with JPEG. Turns out JPEG doesn't have many checksums. Um, but if you try to do it with a zip file or a ping file, these files have checksums. And unless you disable the checksum checking functionality in the program that you're trying to fuzz, it's just going to get stuck because it's too hard to randomly get to the checksum. So it's just going to be like, well, here's inputs and they just don't work. And so it's just not going to be great. Um, so checksums and other things can be needled in a haystack problems like the code that I've shown here. So if it's checking for checksum, it's basically not going to work. And if it's checking, well, you know, variable A has to be DSA, DFD, DFD. And it's like, meh, nah, it's not going to work either. So. AFL works best on formats um, that don't contain checksums. Also, things like source code, which have low entropy. Um, if you have this space, which is large, and valid inputs are a small part of the space, a tiny part of the space, then AFL is not going to work that well. Um, legal programs is sparse, and then interesting programs are sparse. And so even if you do have somehow a program that is legal, Modifying it doesn't work that well and to get another val valid, interesting program. And so source code really doesn't well work well. It is possible to get valid programs and fuzz compilers. And um, John Regeer is someone who's done that a lot. And there's blog posts about that. But you can't quite use just the AFL technique. What you have to do is you have to create random inputs from a grammar. And that's beyond the scope of this course. It's not hard. It's just things that we don't have time to talk about. All right, now coming up with interesting inputs. So the question is, what inputs are likely to trigger a failure, right? You can execute it on successful inputs all the time. That's not telling you very much. So how do you change an existing input to explore more parts of the tested program? And this is a good thing to show when we talk about tests in general. So QA engineer walks into a bar, orders a beer, orders zero beer, orders 999999999 beers, orders lizard, orders minus one beers, orders a right? And so you want to explore the input space uh, in some sort of reasonably comprehensive way. It's obviously not comprehensive. There's a lot of inputs, right? But you want to, you want to make sure that you explore at least interesting parts of the input space. And that's an art and there's no, you can learn heuristics to do that, but there's no magic recipe to do that. It's just something you have to learn to do. Which QA, QA staff can historically be like extremely good at doing this, uh, much better than developers, but QA staff are kind of rare these days. Um, this reply is like, okay, fine. Then first real customer walks in and asks where the bathroom is. The bar bursts into flames, killing everyone, right? So. I guess what this is saying is even if you test the ordering functionality, 
pretty well. You don't necessarily test everything. And if you go beyond where you're trying to test, then things bad, bad things can still happen. Okay, so fuzzers, what we've said before, but not in that much detail, and we'll give a bit more detail, is fuzzers start as a provided test case and keep mutating it. So next week's lecture is going to be a mutation um, in a different context. We're talking about it next week in the context of mutating the program. Here, we're talking about it in terms of mutating the test case. So what we're going to talk about is single bit flips. So you have you know A, and it actually can bit flip to B, or multiple bits at a time. You can do byte flips, byte swaps, byte rotates. So you can just change bytes. You can do arithmetic. So you say, oh, that, that looks like a four bit integer, a four byte integer. We're just going to add values to it. Like we're going to add like 128 to it or some other number. You can change numbers to not interesting integers. So you know that minus one is something that programs often don't actually deal with well, or zero, or two to six, or max int, or max int minus one, or min int and you can combine multiple test cases together. Okay, so you can do random, but there's a lot of things that are hard to get to from random. You can also use dictionaries, um, so that's smarter than just random. Okay, the next thing is sometimes you have systems that expect inputs in particular formats, like XML files, SQL queries, things like that. And so AFL and libflex fuzzer do support additional input files, which are dictionaries um, to use in test case generation, and then use the dictionaries to give the input in a particular format. So question, how do you come up with dictionaries? Well, you can look for token definitions that the program is going to expect, or files that define, define grammars, if the thing has a grammar somehow. You can provide legal inputs with known parts of the grammar as your initial test cases. So that requires some understanding of what the program is going to do. Or you can try to make the fuzzer guess the possible tokens. Okay, so I've said a couple of times that speed is super important. So can we talk about tricks that we can use to run a tested program on as many inputs as possible? Because the more you can run, the more things you are likely to find. So what we would do is startup is often expensive. So we can try to avoid the penalty for startup time. So you start the program once and you let it run and you identify the place where startup is done and you just freeze the program there and you just clone it. And so you don't have to pay the startup time again. Um, initialization is done, you could interpret it as main. That's not great, especially if the program does a lot of initialization after main starts. So you can just say, look, this is starting point, AFL init or LLVM fuzzer initialize. And it runs the program until it gets to that point and then freezes it and clones it. And each time when you want to run a new input, then you run it with that, um, with the cloned version of what you had before. So the next one is also similar to using mock objects, which I guess we don't talk about in this course, but it's a testing technique which allows you to work with things that are difficult to acquire in terms of resources. So the program might try to connect to a remote database, and so you can change it to use a local database instead. Or networks are slow, and so if we can avoid using the network, then that's good. And so there's tools like Wireshark, which allow you to capture network traffic and then replay that traffic. Or you can run many inputs on a single process. So AFL has a persistent mode, um, or it's a default mode for fuzz tar targets in the fuzzer. So AFL, it's like, well, it's going to, yeah, you, you want to be able to run the loop with a bunch of things. And for the fuzzer, we said, look, there's fuzz targets and you just should be able to cause a fuzz, call a fuzz target again and again without restarting the program. And that's going to save you a bunch of time. So big tests, often there's a small test that does the same thing as a big test. Um, test case minimization, that's another thing that we don't cover in this course, but is also useful. And it's useful when you report a bug because you want, the developer when they're fixing the bug doesn't want to like think about things that are extraneous. So test case minimization is also useful for fuzzing. And so we minimize the number of test cases. And so that means that it doesn't have to run the same thing over and over. It's like it gets rid of redundant computation. So when you have two corpuses that give you the same coverage, then you discard the bigger one. Or 
you can try to take an existing corpus and remove parts of it such that it remains unchanged. So basically, this is manual, but it's like if you have too many test cases, try to remove test cases that don't contribute. And you have to make some judgments about what's useful and what's not useful. Usual answer for scaling that you can do is you can fuzz in parallel or you can do distributed fuzzing on a cluster. So OSS fuzz and cluster fuzz or OSS fuzz, which we talked about before, does that. So you run it on multiple computers. Okay, so fuzzing is an active area of research. And so there is automatic fuzz target generation. So you can do API usage mining. And so what we said before was you have to provide the fuzz target. And it's like, how do you do that? Well, you can do it manually, but that's kind of a pain. So let's not. Um, we've talked about fuzzing for finding crashes mostly, but fuzzing can also find slow executions of programs. So you use fuzzing to detect pathological running time complexity of algorithms. You can do domain specific fuzzing. So compiler optimizations, which I talked about um, briefly. So John Regeer, um, Satify and Lily mod module inputs. And so you do things that are specific to the grammar and you generate inputs there. Or you can do checksum aware fuzzing. And so the idea is that you know that inputs are mostly random, but this particular part of the input has to be not random. And so you generate the random input and then you put the checksum where it has to go. And that lets your program continue past the thing that would otherwise block the fuzzing. Machine learning is hot. And so you can improve fuzzing engines with machine learning, or you can improve machine learning with fuzzing fuzzing engines. And finally, you can do hybrid fuzzing using symbolic execution, which we will talk about later in this course. All right, so that's the lecture about fuzzing. It's a useful tool to have. It has limitations. Um, the biggest limitation in my mind is that you don't necessarily know anything about what the compiler, what the program is supposed to do. And so all you can detect is crashes. And so it's a very coarse grained way of reasoning about the program behavior. Uh, having said that, you really don't want your program to crash um, and you don't want your program to buffer overflow. That will often lead to security exploits. And so fuzzing is a useful thing to do when you find that kind of problem. Unfortunately, that doesn't account for all the problems, but we don't really have to solve all the problems in society. We just have to solve problem, some problems, and then maybe someone else will still solve some other problems. So useful tool, you can use it. Um, you should be aware of it, but doesn't solve all the problems. All right, good. Thanks for listening.